Podcast 5 of the Pelvis and Perineum series, the Rectum and Anal Canal. This podcast is going to initially outline the rectum and the anal canal, and then go on to detail faecal continence and the process of defecation. The rectum is the direct continuation of the sigmoid colon into the pelvis, and finishes by joining the anus at the anorectal junction. The rectum is relatively straight and is approximately 12 cm long. It starts at the recto-sigmoid junction, which is at the level of the third sacral vertebra, and in contrast to the colon in the abdomen, the three strips of longitudinal muscle, the tenacoli, are non-existent in the rectum, but these spread out to form a complete outer longitudinal layer of smooth muscle. Also absent from the rectum are the fatty appendices epiplicae, which are found ubiquitously throughout the colon. The rectum extends inferiorly from the recto-sigmoid junction to pass through the pelvic floor. Once it's passed through the pelvic floor, it then becomes the anal canal. At the level of the pelvic floor, the rectum is pulled forward by the puborectalis muscle, and this demarcates the anorectal junction. As the rectum descends from the recto-sigmoid to the anorectal junction, it can be divided into three portions, the upper, middle and lower thirds. Each of these portions has a different peritoneal covering. The upper third is covered by peritoneum on its anterior and lateral sides. The middle third is covered by peritoneum only on its anterior surface, and the lower third is considered subperitoneal, with no peritoneum covering this part of the rectum. In the male, the peritoneum from the middle third of the rectum is reflected onto the bladder, and this creates the vesicorectal pouch. In the female, it is reflected onto the uterus, and this creates the uterorectal pouch, or the pouch of Douglas. Viewed from the anterior aspect, the rectum has three lateral flexures, the superior, middle and inferior. These external flexures are the result of three internal folds, known as the transverse rectal folds. There are two on the left and one on the right. Now before I go on to detail the blood and nerve supply of the rectum, I just want to describe the relations of the rectum in situ. Directly posterior to the rectum are the inferior three sacral vertebrae, the coccyx and the anococcygeal body of the pelvic floor. In males, anterior to the rectum is the bladder base, the seminal vesicles, the ductus deferens and the prostate, whilst in the female, anterior to the rectum is the vagina. The rectum is supplied by three rectal arteries. The superior rectal artery originates from the inferior mesenteric artery and predominantly supplies the superior third of the rectum. The middle rectal artery, derived from the internal iliac, supplies the middle and lower third of the rectum. The inferior rectal artery, arising from the internal pudendal artery, supplies the anorectal junction and parts of the anal canal. It should be noted, though, that there is an extensive collateral circulation from these rectal arteries, which surround and end up supplying the entire rectum. I'll come back to the importance of this blood supply once I've discussed the anal canal. So now let's turn to detailing the anal canal. The anal canal is the inferior extension of the rectum from the anorectal junction to the anus. It is approximately 4 cm long and is usually collapsed except during defecation. The anal canal is surrounded by both the internal and external anal sphincters, which are important, along with the anorectal junction created by puborectalis, in maintaining faecal continence. At the anorectal junction, the wide dilated rectum abruptly narrows as it passes through the pelvic floor to form the anal canal. Lateral to the anal canal, and positioned under the pelvic floor muscles, is the ischioanal fossa. 
This fat filled space is important in allowing the anus to distend during defecation. And I'll detail this important space in a later podcast detailing the perineum. The internal anal sphincters surround the superior two thirds of the anal canal and are comprised of a thickening of the circular smooth muscle that is extended down from the rectum. As it is composed of smooth muscle, this sphincter is controlled by the autonomic nervous system. The contraction and therefore closure of the internal anal sphincter is via the sympathetic fibres derived from the hypogastric plexus. Relaxation of this sphincter to help initiate defecation is mediated via parasympathetic fibres which come from the pelvic splanchnic fibres. The external anal sphincter is a broader voluntary muscle made up of striated fibres. It is located on either side of the inferior two thirds of the anal canal and is attached anteriorly to the perineal body, posteriorly by the anococcygeal body and superiorly it blends with puborectalis of levator ani. As this sphincter is formed from striated muscle, it is under voluntary control. It is therefore innervated by the somatic nervous system. Specifically, this is by the inferior rectal nerve, which is a branch from the pudendal nerve. Internally, the upper two centimetres of the anal canal is characterised by a series of anal columns. The superior limit of these columns is the anorectal junction, whilst the inferior ends of the anal columns are anal valves. These anal valves are associated with anal sinuses, which produce mucus that aids the passage of faeces through the anal canal during defecation. At the inferior limit of the anal column is an irregular line. This is known as the pectinate line. This separates the superior two centimeters of the anal column from the inferior. This separates the superior two centimeters of the anal column from the inferior two centimeters. This demarcation is important due to a number of reasons. Firstly, the embryonic origin of the anal canal. The superior portion is considered visceral as it is derived from the embryonic endoderm and contains columna mucosa. The inferior portion below the pectinate line is derived from the ectoderm and contains keratinized squamous mucosa. Secondly, the superior portion of the anal column is supplied by the superior rectal artery, whilst the lower portion is supplied by the middle and inferior rectal arteries. Thirdly, the renous drainage above the pectinate line drains via the superior rectal vein. Thirdly, the venous drainage above the pectinate line is via the superior rectal vein, which drains into the inferior mesenteric vein and is therefore part of the portal system, whilst the venous drainage inferior to the pectinate line drains into the inferior rectal vein, which is part of the systemic circulation. Due to the extensive rectal plexus of veins associated with the anal canal, you can see the existence of a porta systemic anastomosis. Finally, and with regard to the lymphatic drainage, Lymph returning from above the pectinate line will follow the arterial supply to the internal iliac lymph nodes, whilst below the pectinate line it will travel to the superficial inguinal lymph nodes. So to finish the podcast, I just want to briefly mention faecal continence and the process of defecation. Faecal continence is maintained by the two anal sphincters the autonomic controlled internal sphincter and the somatic controlled external sphincter. The anorectal junction maintained by the sling-like puborectalis muscle and the various mucosal folds and abdominal pressure. In order to defecate, parasympathetic fibres control the movement of faeces from the colon to the rectum. Entry of faeces into the rectum stretches the wall of the rectum and this information is registered at the conscious level. Now on the toilet, the somatic nervous system relaxes puborectalis 
which straightens the anorectal junction and relaxes the external anal sphincter via the pudendal nerve. The colon and rectum continue to contract under the continued control of parasympathetic fibres and you strain via the contracting anterior abdominal wall to increase intra-abdominal pressure and you also close the larynx. The anal canal then shortens and becomes wider by the parasympathetically controlled longitudinal muscle and as the pectinate line emerges so fecal evacuation occurs. So from this description you can see that the process of defecation involves numerous muscles and is controlled by both the autonomic and the somatic nervous systems. So in this podcast I've provided details regarding both the rectum and the anal canal and finished off with the process of defecation. In the next podcast, number six, I will detail the branches of the internal iliac artery.